Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah. The pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan. Night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. It is Ramadan. It is Ramadan. Brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to our show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zahir. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing and, inshallah, answering the question when is fasting? obligatory and exempted. Dr. Zakia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakia, like I said, we have a mountain to climb tonight with this topic. I'm sure there are many people who will benefit from your answers tonight, inshallah. Inshallah. The first of those, is fasting obligatory upon all Muslims? Or is there a distinct group that Allah refers to when it comes to fasting, in the month of Ramadan particularly? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain. There are five conditions to be fulfilled to make fasting obligatory on any person. Number one is he or she should be a Muslim. Number two, the person should be sane. Number three, he or she should have reached the age of puberty. That means he or she should be an adult. Number four, the person should be healthy. Number five, the person should not be in a state of traveling. He or she should be settled. There are additional four conditions for a female to be fulfilled. If it's a woman, if it's a lady, if it's a female, there are additional four conditions to be fulfilled to make it obligatory on her. Number one is that she should not be menstruating. She should not be in a position where she has postnatal bleeding. She should not be breastfeeding and she should not be pregnant. So for a woman, if all these nine conditions are fulfilled, then it becomes obligatory on her. And for the male, only the first five conditions have to be fulfilled to make it compulsory for them to fast in the month of Ramadan. From what you've said, then, my understanding is that Fasting is a Muslim-only prerogative. Is that correct? That's right. It is compulsory only for a Muslim to fast. It is not a requirement for a non-Muslim or unbeliever to fast. And the reason is that Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 39, that the deeds of a non-believer, a person who is a non-Muslim, the deeds of an unbeliever is like a mirage in a desert. And the thirsty person thinks that there is water, but when he reaches there, he does not find anything else, but he finds Allah. And Allah will pay him for his deeds. And Allah is swift in taking of accounts. That means in the year after, the unbeliever, for his deeds, he will get nothing. And Allah is swift in taking of accounts. So for unbeliever, all the deeds they are useless in the hereafter because all the deeds have to be accompanied with the intention. And as we discussed yesterday, that one of the criteria, an important criterion for a person fast to be accepted is the niyyah, it is the intention. And the intention is that the fast should only be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. So if a non-Muslim, if an unbeliever who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where is the question of him doing the niyyah, doing the intention of fasting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So that's the reason it is not required for unbeliever to fast. If he fasts without the intention, it will just be like anything else. It will not be an act of worship. It will not be a fast as is considered in Islam. So therefore, the niyyah, the intention is very important. So for unbeliever, any act of worship, until he has faith, 
until he believes, until he believes that there is only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, unless he says the kalama, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that there is no God but Allah, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah, all the acts of worship, they're useless for the hereafter. But the moment a non-believer, a person who's not a Muslim, he accepts Islam, for him, it becomes obligatory. If he accepts Islam in the middle of the month of Ramadan, from that moment onwards, fasting becomes compulsory for him. But the past, Allah will not take into account. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 38, that say to the unbelievers, that if they start believing, the past will be forgiven. That means the moment a non-Muslim accepts Islam, all his past sins will be forgiven. But the moment he accepts Islam, from that time it becomes obligated on him to fast. Well, I myself fasted half of Ramadan without being Muslim. So now I know the answer. <laughs> now I'd like to come to the age of maturity, the coming of age, as we say in the West. In some places, the coming of age is noted as being 18, and others 14, as young as 14. What does Islam specify as being the coming of age? As far as the rules of the different countries are concerned, in India, the age of adulthood or maturity is 18, Indonesia it is 19, in UK it is 16 years of age. Every country, the age of maturity, what the government or the people of the country, or the law, it is different, depending upon their own understanding. But in Islam, fasting becomes compulsory. Salah becomes compulsory. The acts of worship become compulsory once a person reaches the age of puberty. And there are basically three criteria. If any one of these three criteria are fulfilled, then the person is said to have reached the age of puberty. Number one is that growth of coarse pubic hair around the private parts. Number two, the person reaches the age of 15. Or there is emission of semen in a wet dream or otherwise. Or if it's a female, then she starts her menstrual cycles. The day the girl starts her menstrual cycle, she is supposed to have reached the age of puberty, irrespective, she may be below the age of 10. But the moment she reaches, the day she starts her menstrual cycle, she's considered to be a person who has reached the age of puberty. Well, that's interesting as well because you mentioned that uh, it could be as young as 10 that uh, a girl would reach puberty and often said in the West. And even now, it's quite common. Now recently an article came a couple of months back that in Delhi, it is not uncommon for a girl of the age of 10 to start her menstrual cycles. Only if it is before the age of 9, there is a point to be worried about. Same in the Western world. Previously, it wasn't there when I did my medical college. The age was said that in the Western world, about 12 to 13. India, it was 13 to 14. But now, because of the change in diet and the change of climate, etc., all this has an effect on the age of puberty. But now, it's quite common that girls of the age of 10, even before 10, at the age of 9, many of them, they start the menstrual period. Right. And they seem to be maturing quicker than the boys as well. Um, That's another question. That's right. Now, Dr. Zakia, on to the second category of people. We're talking about exemptions. Can you list or mention all of the different categories of people that are exempted from fasting during the month of Ramadan? There are, in total, according to me, 13 categories of people who are exempted from fasting. The first is, if the person is an unbeliever, if he's a non-Muslim. Number two, if he or she is a minor. Number three, if the person is insane. Number four, if it's a lady and she is menstruating, she did not fast. Number five, if she has her postnatal bleeding, she's exempted from fasting. Number six, if she's pregnant, then she's exempted. Number seven, if she's breastfeeding, she's exempted. Number eight, if the person is ill or is sick, he or she is exempted. Number nine, if the person is disabled. Number ten, that if 
the person is very elderly, has reached a very old age. Number 11, if the person is traveling. Number 12, if the person is taking part in jihad or a fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number 13, under compulsion. Under compulsion, if someone forces and if the person doesn't fast, he or she is exempted. These are, in short, the 13 categories in which a person is exempted from fasting. Excellent. Now, I think we need to discuss each category on its own merits. Dr. Zakia, do all of the people that you've mentioned in the exempted categories have to make up their fast later on? Out of the 13 categories which I mentioned, the first three categories, they don't have to make up their fast later on. That is a non-Muslim, that's a person who's a minor, and a person who's insane. Out of the remaining 10 categories, two categories, a person who is disabled for long, and a person who is very elderly. These two people also don't have to make up for their fast, but they have to pay a ransom, the feeding of a poor person for every fast they missed. As far as the other eight categories are concerned, the moment the condition in which they are, it gets reversed, then they have to make up for the fast which they missed. For example, in the eight categories are, the menstruating lady, moment she finishes the menstruation, then she should make up for a fast as soon as possible, before the next Ramadan. A woman who is in the period of postnatal bleeding, the moment it gets over, she has to fast. If a lady is pregnant, the moment the pregnancy gets over and the postnatal bleeding gets over, then she has to fast. If a lady, the fourth category, if she's breastfeeding, after the breastfeeding is over, then she has to fast. Or a person is sick, the moment he gets healthy, he or she has to fast. Similarly, a person who's traveling, the moment he finishes his traveling, he has to fast. And a person who's taking part in jihad, fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment the fight gets over, he or she has to fast. Similarly, a person who's in compulsion and is not fasting, the moment the compulsion is removed, he or she has to fast. But naturally, all these have to be done before the next Ramadan. What's your thoughts on children fasting the month of Ramadan before they get to the age of puberty? As I mentioned earlier, it is not compulsory for a child who has not reached the age of puberty to fast. It's not compulsory. They're exempted. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, there's a hadith in Tirmidhi, hadith number 1423, a beloved Prophet said that the pen has been lifted up from three categories of people. A child until he reaches puberty, a sleeping person until he wakes up, and a person who's insane until he becomes of sound mind. So these three categories of people, the beloved Prophet said, that the pen has been lifted, that means it's not obligatory on them to fast. Same as prayer, also they aren't obliged. But it's good to encourage our children to fast as early as possible, though it's not compulsory. And there's a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1960, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad he tells the people of Ansar, he sends a messenger and tells them to inform that those who are fasting, they should continue fasting. Those who are not fasting should fast till the end of the day. And after that, the people, the Sahaba, they said, we fasted and we even asked our children to fast. And we took them to the massages. And if they cried, we gave them toys of wool so that to keep themselves busy till the time of iftar. That means this is how the Sahabas, they encouraged the children to fast at an early age, though it was not compulsory. And this is a good habit. But many a time that we see nowadays that many of the parents, they discourage the children from fasting. Even if the child is enthusiastic and says, I want to fast, many parents say, at this young age, it's not required, don't fast. They fail to realize that fasting at a young age will not cause them any harm. In fact, it will give them a training to fast when they reach puberty. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tahrim, chapter number 66, Verse number six. Ya ayyuh lazina amunu. O you believe, save yourself and your families from the torment of hellfire, whose fuel is men and stones. Allah is reminding the people that don't only save yourself, even your children from the hellfire, whose fuel is men and stones. So it is good 
to encourage our children to fast at an early age. And that's what we do in the school that we are running, the Islamic International School. We encourage them to fast at an early age, even when they are in junior kg or in senior kg, at the age of four, five, six, we encourage them. And at this age, the age of four, five, six, we say that the person who fasts the maximum in the class will get a gift, will get a reward. And that encourages them. And when they reach standard first, that is approximately the age of six, Alhamdulillah, most of the children fast the full month. And by the time they reach standard third, that's about seven, eight years, almost all of them fast the full month of Ramadan. That's not compulsory. So Alhamdulillah, and when they see other children fasting, imagine most of the parents, they tell them that, oh, it's not required. But the children, they force that we want to fast because of competition, mm -hmm. because of seeing their friends, all of them fasting. So if they don't fast, they feel ashamed. Though it's not a farad on them. But the atmosphere you create, we don't tell them it is far too fast. But the atmosphere of competition, the atmosphere of loving each other and loving the religion, loving Allah and His Rasul. So in this way, Alhamdulillah, like it is said in a hadith, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, mentioned in Tirmidhi, that when a child reaches the age of seven, we should teach him to offer salah. And at the age of 10, you can even use force. So that means scholars say, you can do the same thing even for fasting. But we start at a much earlier age, but it is not force that we use. We use love, affection, and gifts and rewards. And Alhamdulillah, it has a tremendous effect on the children. Oh, that's beautiful. Next question, very important one. One of the categories you've mentioned, an insane person is exempted. Uh, why is this? The insane person is exempted because the same hadith that I quoted earlier, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 1423, that the pen is lifted from three categories of people. A child till he reaches puberty, a person who's sleeping till he wakes up, and a person who's insane till he becomes a sound mind. So this the Prophet has exempted, and they are free from fasting. The reason is because one of the criteria for the fasting to be accepted is niyah, is intention. And intention can only be made by a person who's sane, who's sound in mind. Only if he's sound, can he willingly intend to fast. If he's insane, he cannot. So that's the reason if an insane person, whether he fasts or not, it doesn't make a difference at all. It is, he's exempted. And once he becomes sane, he does not have to compensate also for the fast he has made because he's not responsible for that. He's not held responsible. So that's the beauty of Islam. They only held responsible those people who should be held responsible. Only those people who have got, got the responsibility to make the intention knowingly. That's right. Okay, that's excellent. Next question from the point of view of a woman who is undergoing menstruation, postnatal bleeding. Is it prohibited or optional for them to fast? To start. As far as the women who are undergoing the menstrual cycles or postnatal bleeding, according to our beloved Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, also in Sahih Muslim, that it is forbidden for a woman to fast who is bleeding due to menstrual cycle or postnatal bleeding. So it is not optional, it is forbidden. And the reason is because when the blood flows out in a lady, in a woman, she loses a lot of blood. And on top of that, if she fasts, it will not be good for her health. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is His mercy that He has exempted them and made it compulsory not to fast, otherwise it may be damaging for the health. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to overburden any of the human beings. So that's the reason they are exempted from fasting. And even in the middle of the day, if the menstruation begins, they have to break their fast. Even if it begins a few minutes before sunset, they have to break their fast. But they have to compensate later on. But if they're undergoing the menstrual period, and if the period stops just before Fajr, even if they did not have a bath, they can start their fast. But if it ends, even a few minutes after Fajr, they cannot fast. They have to break their fast, and they have to compensate later on. Okay, the next query really is regarding a woman who is pregnant or is nursing, breastfeeding, nursing, rearing the children. Why are they exempted? According to the words of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, 
verse number 185, that if a person is ill and traveling, he can make up his prescribed periods of day of fasting later on. So most of the fuqahs, most of the scholars, they say that these women who are pregnant and breastfeeding, they come under the category of those who are ill. So therefore, if they want, they can abstain from fasting. But there are clear-cut say hadith in which the Prophet has exempted these women from fasting. Mentioned in Sunan ibn Majah, hadith number 1667, that a beloved Prophet says, the obligation for a person to fast and part of the prayer who has been lifted from a traveller. And the obligation for fasting has been lifted from a lady who is pregnant and who is breastfeeding. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad also said, it's mentioned in Sunan Nisai, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2274, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has relieved the traveller from fasting and half his prayer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has relieved the pregnant woman and the woman who is breastfeeding from fasting. So based on these two hadith also, it's clear cut that the pregnant woman and the women who are breastfeeding, they have been exempted. And the logical reason that one can think is because when a lady, she is pregnant or she is breastfeeding, the food she eats is not only for herself, it's for herself as well as the baby she is carrying or the baby she is feeding. So but natural, if her fasting makes it difficult for her or become difficult for a baby, then she's exempted from fasting. But if she's in the early stage of pregnancy, and if she feels, or she's breastfeeding, and if she feels that fasting will not cause any damage to her health, and will not cause a damage to the baby, then she should fast. If she has a doubt, if she can do it with hardship, as long as there's no damage to herself, to her health, and the baby, she has the option to fast, not to fast. But if it's causing damage to her health, or the baby, it becomes haram for her to fast. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to lay a burden more than what a person can bear. And in this regard, that is the reason Allah has exempted them. Later on when they are healthy, when they stop breastfeeding, or when the pregnancy ends after postnatal bleeding, then they have to make up for the fast they have missed before the next Ramadan. Regarding a person who is a bit incapacitated due to illness, headache or stomach ache, um, they also exempted from fasting? The people who are ill, they are exempted. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that if a person is ill and travelling, he can make up his prescribed periods of day of fasting later on. But that does not mean if a person is suffering from a headache or a stomach ache or a cough, he should not fast. If a person can fast, if he's sick, it becomes compulsory for him to fast. The only time he's exempted is if fasting becomes difficult due to his illness. Or if he fast, his illness would be increased or his health would deteriorate. Or it's compulsory for him to take some medicine due to his illness, then it becomes prohibited. Otherwise, for small issues or for small reasons like cough, like cold, like headache, like stomachache, fasting is compulsory. And the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exempted those people who are ill, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to put a burden. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195, that do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction. If I'm ill, and if I know that fasting is going to cause a loss for me, will deteriorate my health, it's like killing myself. So Allah said it's prohibited. So if I know fasting will deteriorate my health, then it becomes prohibited. Similarly, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 29, that kill not yourselves, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. So causing a loss or a damage to your own health yourself is prohibited in Islam. So this exemption is mainly for those people for whom it is difficult or it will deteriorate the health, not for small ailments. Okay. We should be very careful to make sure our illness is reasonably severe then. That's right. Next point, if you like, regarding the situation of a disabled person. Why is it a disabled person has to pay a ransom due to the fact they haven't fasted? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 184, 
that if it is difficult for a person to fast, he can either fast or pay a ransom. That is feeding of an indigent person or a poor person. The reason is that if a person is disabled or if he's sick permanently and there are no signs that he will become healthy where he can observe fast. So the question of him compensating or the question for him to keep the fast later on doesn't arise at all. So that's the reason for him there is a ransom that he has to pay something that is equivalent to feeding an indigent person or feed an indigent person for every fast that he has missed. Dr. Zakir, regarding elderly people, which category of elderly people are exempt from fasting? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 184, that if it is difficult for a person to fast, he can either fast or he can give a ransom, that is feeding of a poor person. As far as those elderly people who are exempted are, those people whose health is so weak that if they fast, it will damage the health. A person who's reached a very elderly age, the age is not fixed whether it is 60, 70, or 80, or 90, depending upon his health condition. Due to the old age, if his health condition is bad, which prevents him from fasting, then is the time where he should feed one indigent person. And there's a hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 6, hadith number 4505, where our beloved Prophet said that the old elderly men and women, they need not fast, but they have to feed one poor person for every fast they skip. And similarly, there are various hadith. For example, if you read Dara Kutni, two stroke, 208, it says that if a person who has to give a ransom, he has to feed a poor person one mud of wheat. One mud is equal to two hands outstretched full of wheat. That's what you should feed. There's another hadith which says in Dar al Kutni, two stroke, 270, that Anas Mallah would please with him one year when he became very old and he could not fast. So at the end of the month, he called 30 poor people and he fed them with bread, crumbs and meal, a proper meal for 30 poor people. So it means that for every fast you miss, you should feed one poor person. But coming back to the question that if the elderly person is of sound mind and not healthy, that's the time he has to feed a person or give ransom. But if a person is elderly and he becomes insane, if he's not of sound mind, then he doesn't have to fast, he's exempted, neither does he have to give any ransom, neither he has to compensate because he is like a child. As our beloved Prophet said earlier, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. that the pen has been lifted on three categories of people. Mm -hmm. Person who's a child reaches puberty. So these people again become like children or they become like a person who's insane. We say that the person has become senile. So if he reaches an age in which his mental stability is not there, he need not fast, neither does he have to compensate the fast later on, neither has to pay any ransom. Okay, that just about answers that one then. Regarding the situation uh, of a traveler, is it forbidden or optional uh, for a traveler to fast? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that if you are ill or on a journey, the prescribed number of days for fasting can be made later on. So this is a concession given. That means if you want to fast, you can fast. If you want to exempt yourself, exempt, but later on you have to make up the period. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here has compared the traveler and kept him or her in the same category as the person who is ill. Because the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, hadith number 1804, our beloved Prophet said that traveling is a punishment. Or when a person goes on a journey, it's like a punishment. That means it's difficult. He has to undergo many hardships. And it is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, book of fasting, hadith number 1943, there was a Sahaba with him, Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him. And he used to always fast even on a journey. So he asked the Prophet that should he fast on a journey or not? So the Prophet said, if you wish to fast, you can fast. 
If you don't want to fast, you don't fast. That means it was optional. If a person wanted to fast, he could fast. If he didn't want, he did not fast. For example, if a person who is used to traveling and he does not find any hardship, and if he fasts, there's no problem, it's good for him. Or if a person feels hardship and doesn't want to fast, then he need not fast. And this you come to know from the hadith of uh, Hadith Anas, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three. Hadith number 1947, where Hadith Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, then when we used to travel with the Prophet, some of the companions, they fasted. Some of them did not fast. But those who kept the fast did not criticize those who did not keep the fast. And those who did not fast, they did not criticize those who fasted. So basically, it's optional. Those who can take the strain and want to fast, they can. Those who don't want, it's up to them. Logically, from there, we, we can deduce that uh, it's an optional That's right. fast. But if a person decides to opt to fast whilst traveling, are they in a situation where they get more reward from Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the previous verse, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 184, that those who are ill or on a journey, they can make up their fast later on. Or for a person for whom fasting is difficult, he can either fast or he can give a ransom, feeding of an indigent person. But let them know that fasting is better. So this proves that fasting is better, though they are exempted if they want. There is no sin on them, they can keep it up later on. But it is better. And we find in several hadith, if you read the hadith of the beloved Prophet, it's mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number two, book of fasting, hadith number 2492, that there was a time when the Sahabas, they traveled with the Prophet. And because it was very hot, none of them fasted, except the Prophet and one Sahaba, Abdullah bin Abi Rabah. There's another hadith, several other hadith in Sai Muslim, volume two, book of fasting, Hadith number 2472 and 2473. That the companion is a child with the Prophet. And some of the companions fasted, some didn't fast. And when the Prophet, when he came to know that it was becoming difficult for the companion to fast, he broke the fast. In another hadith, Sai Muslim, volume number two, book of fasting, hadith number 2472. Once when the Prophet, in the year of the victory of Makkah, he goes to a place along with the Sahabas. And he realizes that some of the Sahabas who were fasting, they were finding it difficult to fast. So the Prophet, at the Asr prayer time, he took a goblet of water and he drank. He broke the fast. So that it becomes easier for the other. But from all these hadiths we come to know that the Prophet preferred to fast unless it was difficult. And he broke the fast. Why? Because the other companions, they found it difficult. He did not want to put them in a critical situation. Therefore, he broke the fast. But from here we come to know that fasting is better if you can. If you cannot, then there's no problem. You may not fast and you can make up the fast later on. Further we come to know that it is preferable to fast. Why? Because if a person delays his fasting, if he's traveling, and God forbid, if his life comes to an end or whatever it is, then that would yet be a thing which is left for him to do, a faraiz. So if a person can fast, while traveling, it's preferable that he fasts. And uh, furthermore, when you're traveling in the month of Ramadan, even the people around you, they fast. So it's easier in that sense. When you come back home and the month of Ramadan is over, and if you individually want to fast and no one else is fasting, it becomes many a times difficult. So that's one of the reasons also that if you can do it with the hardship and fast while traveling, it's better and even sawab is more. Why is a person that is partaking in jihad exempted from fasting? When a person is taking part in jihad, but natural fasting will make him weak, and he will not be able to perform that well in jihad while fighting the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the reason the beloved Prophet said. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 2, chapter number 420 in the book of fasting, hadith number 2486, that when Prophet Muhammad was going for jihad, he told the Sahabas that we are approaching the enemies. And if you don't fast, it will make you stronger. So break the fast. After this statement, some of the 
sahabas, they broke the fast. Some of them did continued fasting. The next time they stopped, the Prophet said, fasting will make you weak. If you don't fast, you'll be stronger. So break your fast and I command you, you break it. That's the time when everyone broke. So therefore, but natural, when we fast, we make ourselves stronger. So we can fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a better way. And the more chances of victory, inshallah. Okay, excellent. Um, Professor Zakir, we've received, as you are aware, thousands of uh, questions from our viewers uh, relating to the topic of Ramadan, and particularly uh, when is fasting obligatory and exempted. So we've got a number of questions we've got to get through now. First one is from one of our viewers, and he asks the question, what is the maximum number of days as a traveler that he can stay in a given city continuously and be exempted from his fast. For instance, he goes on to say, um, if he's a student, he's giving the game away here, if he's a student and he's traveled abroad for two months, is he exempted from his fast in Ramadan? Most of the scholars, what they say, that what is the ruling for Salah? When a person travels, as the hadith I quoted earlier, that a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, mentioned in the Sunan ibn Majah, hadith number 1667, that a beloved Prophet says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exempted a person from fasting and half of these prayers when he's traveling and exempted a woman from fasting when she's pregnant, etc. So the ruling what is there for Salah as a traveler, it is the same as for a person who's fasting. And most of the fuqahs, most of the scholars, though the difference of opinion, but as for Salah, they say that maximum person can stay in a city in one place after he has left his own hometown is for four days. So most of the scholars, they agree that same thing is for fasting, that maximum they can stay in a city and can be considered as a traveler is for four days. If they extend, then they will not be considered as a traveler. Though there is a difference of opinion in different schools of thought, but the majority consider this. Coming to the second part of the question, that if a person goes for studies and stays in a foreign land, maybe for two months or three months or several months together, will he be considered as a traveler? No. In this condition, he's staying for a long time, for months together. As far as fasting is concerned, he will have to fast all the obligatory fast of the month of Ramadan. Next question. If a fasting person, he's been fasting the whole day, decides to travel in the afternoon, he starts his travel in the afternoon, is it compulsory on him to break his fast or is it optional? What is the best solution for him? If a person starts the travel midday or in the afternoon, and if he's in the hometown till afternoon, it becomes fourth for him to keep the fast at least at that time. Only time a traveler is permitted to break the fast is when he leaves the hometown. If he decides that he's going to leave in the afternoon, it's not possible that he does not fast in the morning. He has to fast in the morning because there can be change of plans. If he decides in the afternoon, he may change his plan. So then it will be a sin on him. So if a person is traveling, the only time he can break the fast is when he leaves the city limits. Until he hasn't left, he should not break. So if he leaves the city limits in the afternoon, he is permitted to break, not that he should break. But if he feels there's no hardship, he can continue fasting and complete his fast. It's optional on him. Okay, excellent. Next question is from one of our viewers who's a pilot, and he considers himself to be in a perpetual state of travel. <laughs> Every day he's traveling on the plane, um, long distances. And um, he's asking, is he exempted therefore from all fasts. If a person's profession is such that he's a pilot or if he's a sailor and he has to travel and if he leaves his hometown and if he's gone away, so but naturally he's considered as a traveler. He's exempted from fasting, but he has to make up his fast before the next of Ramadan. So if he travels a lot, then he'll have to fast in the holidays, mm -hmm. whatever holidays he gets, and when he's stationed in hometown. So if he does not want to fast, he's exempted, he was considered as a traveller, but he'll have to make up the fast as soon as possible before the next Ramadan. Unless he's traveling on a very long flight, maybe from India to New York, which is more than 12 hours, but if the, if the flight is a short flight, 
I don't think so there'll be problem. Okay, next question is from a person who usually works and or he stays, usually stays in Saudi Arabia. And the last Ramadan, he started his fast in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia has a difference of two days, or it did last year anyway, um, from India, which is his hometown. So he came to his hometown. And by the time he'd reached, he'd already fasted two days in Saudi Arabia. He wants to know, does he have to finish 30 days and then be left with uh, two days in his hometown, which uh, the other people around him are still fasting? Should he consider this to be the point of reference or Saudi Arabia to be the point of reference, I think is the question. According to the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in a Sahih hadith of Tirmidhi in the book of fasting, hadith number 697. The Prophet said, start your fast with the people who are starting the fast. Means if you live in a country or live in a place, if those people are fasting, you should fast. And break your fast with the people around you when they break the fast. So if he lives in Saudi Arabia, he should start his fast with the people of Saudi Arabia. If in between in Ramadan, if he goes back to his original home in India, then he should fast till the time his people are fasting. And I'm aware that many a time there's a difference of a couple of days. Mm -hmm. So if he starts his fast two days earlier and he goes to India, by the time he finishes his 30 fast, the people of India may yet have one or two fasts left. But yet he has to continue fasting till the people of India, even though it exceeds more than 30 days. Mm. It may be 31, sometimes 32 days. Because Hadith says that fast with the people who are fasting around you and break the fast with the people who are breaking the fast around you. But if it is the vice versa, if he starts the fast in India two days late and then comes to Saudi Arabia, then maybe he'll fast 28 days. So in this case, he has to start with the people of India, end with the people of Saudi Arabia, and he cannot fast on the eighth day because it is haram. But after that, he has to at least fast one more day because in any lunar month, it's 29 days. So he should at least fast additional one or two days to make up for 29 or 30 days so that it doesn't mean that he has fasted less than the minimum requirement. Uh, next question, there's a gentleman who says he's an engineer, final year, would-be graduate, student. His final year examination lies in the month of Ramadan. We were talking about last Ramadan, I believe. His mother and his parents have advised him not observe the fast during the month of Ramadan because it may affect his examination results. Is he exempted from fasting on this basis? A person who does not want to fast only because of the examination, it is not a valid reason. Even though it may be a final exam, and maybe the parents may coax that don't fast, because if you fast, then maybe your concentration will go down and the results will become less. Even if the parents force, at this point of time, the child, the son or the daughter should not listen to the parents. Because if the parents tell you something, which is against the teaching of Allah and the Rasul. That's the only time where they can disobey the parents. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an kabut chapter 29, verse number 8, as well as in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 15, that if your parents force you or strive to do jihad to make you worship somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not obey them. But yet, live with them with love and companionship. So here, Quran gives you permission because that is not a legitimate reason that because the examination is there, they don't want to fast so that they can get good marks. Getting marks in the akhirah, doing a faraiz, is more important. That is the reason this is not a valid reason and the person should yet fast. Inshallah, Allah will help him and he will do better in the examination. Mm. But the help of Allah is more important than any other help. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 160, if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who will dare, then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my advice is that even if it's examination, let them fast. Inshallah, the concentration will be better and they'll get better marks, inshallah. More taqwa and trust in Allah. That's the answer. Good. Another question relating to travel, travel and fast. What's the minimum distance of travel during which are exempted from fasting 
This is the same answer as for Salah. What is the distance considered for a traveler so that he can do Qasar in his Salah, shorten in his Salah, is the same for fasting. Two the different the opinion, but the majority of the scholars, they say it is 16 farsak. Each farsak is for three miles. So it is more than 48 miles if a person travels. Or if a person travels more than 80 kilometers, he's considered as a traveler. But some scholars say it's 83, some say 84 kilometers. So the say said more than 80 kilometers, more than 84 kilometers, a person is considered as a traveler. But the basic thing is, he should not be in his own hometown. There are some cities which are very large, and the distance from one end of the city to the other end can be more than 84 kilometers. Then he's not considered as a traveler. He should be in a foreign city. So, Dr. Zakia, we've yet again we've reached the end of another show, and alhamdulillah, I'm so glad that we were able to answer some of the viewers' questions. It was so nice and such nice answers and very succinct as well, alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you all benefited immensely from the answers that we got from Dr. Zakir today regarding the topic that we've selected. And tomorrow, I hope you will join us at the same time when we will be discussing acts which invalidate the fast or acts which are prohibited whilst fasting. Same time tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>